Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. Um, so, uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Ellen Lapes, and I direct the uh, International Security Masters Program and the Center for Security Policy Studies with my colleague Mike Hunsiger, who is in Fairfax. Um, we are gathering because there's a very critical world event that is both something that all of us in the public policy world should be thinking about, but it also has a very deep and profound human dimension to it. And I think we are all a little bit agitated uh, watching the suffering and the, the uh, horrific events that we're seeing. So it is an opportunity for us to pool our knowledge, to try to build some deeper understanding, but we're also very, very fortunate to have two uh, Ukrainian perspectives on the program tonight. So I hope we will all be you know, attentive listeners, and uh, even if we have perhaps very different views on the policy options ahead of us, uh, we want to make sure that this is a forum in which everybody's views can be heard. Um, we are collaborating. It's the CSPS here in Arlington, master's program, with the learning centers, the undergraduate learning centers in Fairfax. And I want to invite uh, Eric McGlinchey to join in a word of welcome and uh, tell us what's going on in Fairfax, and then we'll go to our speakers. Great. Thanks, Ellen. First, can I do a sound check? Can people in Arlington hear okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, first, let me just say uh, I'm joined up here with uh, Professor Mark Katz and Professor Mike Hunziger. We will be speaking from the Fairfax side. Uh, and let me just say on behalf of Professors Shazley, uh, Professor uh, Peter Mandeville, um, I am, and myself, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the uh, Char School undergraduate learning communities. Uh, we serve respectively as the directors of the undergraduate research community, the uh, Democracy Lab, and the IR Policy Task Force. These are three new learning communities here at the Shar School. Uh, the mission of these learning communities is to use objective analysis, promote good scholarship, good government, and human rights. So tonight's discussion is very much in the spirit of what we're doing in the learning communities. And I should also note that this is a mission that regrettably is difficult to accomplish right now. Uh, if, for example, you were a university student in Ukraine or in Russia, I should add. Uh, in Ukraine, if you were a student, rather than being in a classroom, you would probably be on the front lines, right? Uh, so you would be protecting uh, Kyiv, Odessa, Kharkiv uh, on the front lines rather than being in, in, in a classroom. Um, in Russia, and I think this is worth something to think about and, and pause, uh, the opportunity to objectively analyze what's going on is now all but non-existent. Right? So there's a, there's a, essentially, there's, there's military law and the media has, the free media has essentially been shut down. Um, so uh, what I'd ask you to think about today is reflect on this conversation and reflect on what your colleagues in Russia and Ukraine, what they may be thinking about, and think about what we can do, what we can do to help end this war, to hold the aggressors of this war accountable, and then to assist a democratic Ukraine, as well as Russian Democrats, to escape the suffocating, uh, the suffocating shadow of Putin's authoritarianism. And with that, I would like to I would like to to uh, give the mic to Professor Katz, who is actually going to tell us a little bit uh, about Putin and his authoritarian rule. So, uh, Professor Katz, here's the lava beer. Oh, great. If you want to just so... Uh, while Mark is getting ready, let me just make one other quick announcement. When we fill up these seats, uh, we'll send people who may be arriving. We have a very comfortable spillover room um, in down on the first floor where there's plenty of room to spread out and you will see that they will see the same two screens and we'll be able to ask a question. So thank you. Um, over to you. Okay, so can you all hear me over there in Arlington? <laughs> okay, I'm just gonna assume that you you can. Anyway. I saw a thumbs up. Okay, very good. So, well, it's uh, it, it's good to be here with you all this evening, but I have to say, obviously, the circumstances are not so good. I wish we didn't have these circumstances that we were meeting under. Uh, but in any event, uh, I have a difficult task trying to explain what's in the mind of Vladimir Putin, and I think it comes as no surprise that uh, 
We're not really certain exactly what's in his mind. Uh, he has given us some clues in, in some of his various statements. In the last summer, he had this article uh, he posted on the president of Russia's website uh, on Ukraine. And of course, there's was a speech he gave, uh, I guess, you know, uh, in February, you know, sort of justifying you know, sort of how awful Ukraine is. In any event, uh, Putin's launched the, this invasion of Ukraine, a terrible war, uh, suffering has been inflicted uh, on Ukrainians. Uh, but if Putin was hoping for a quick victory, he's obviously been disappointed. Instead, the Ukrainians have put up a fierce resistance against Russia. America and the West have imposed extremely serious economic sanctions uh, on Russia that are affecting it severely. And Putin's actions have also made Russia a pariah in much of the world. And I don't think Putin wanted all of this. So I want to explore here a little bit why has Putin invaded Ukraine? Did he miscalculate? And what might the consequences be? Hopefully, it will depend on Professor McGlinch to keep time for me here. Anyway, why did he invade Ukraine? Now, I think that one of the important things to understand about Putin and the Russian nationalists in general is that they have this belief that Ukraine really is part of Russia, that it was historically part of Russia. There was the, the Kevin Roos and Muscovy, there were all these things. Not like I know necessarily tremendous details about it, but they're sure that Ukraine is part of Russia and that, as he uh, said in his speech, it was, it was Vladimir Lenin who created these union republics who artificially separated Ukraine from Russia. And if, and if you, therefore, if you support Ukraine, you are a Leninist. And that's a bad, very bad thing. Um, he also seems to believe that most Ukrainians, in other words, like, sort of like Donald Trump, all you know, mo many people tell me or whatever, <laughs> that many Ukrainians tell him that Ukrainians are all pro-Russian, that they all see themselves as Russian, and that those who do not are literally fascists, or they are brainwashed from the West for both. In other words, there is no legitimate Ukrainian view of Ukrainian should be separate from Russia, that they that, that such views are illegitimate and have to be dealt with forcibly. Uh, Putin also has this tremendous fear about NATO and European Union expansion, that he sees them as being aimed at weakening Russia. Uh, and there, you know, even despite the fact that you know, NATO has expanded, but American troop presence in Europe has shrunk uh, tremendously. So it's not clear how it's expansion. Now, it's, it's for other things besides. Russia, uh, but that's a different subject. Uh, but he sees that NATO, Ukraine's desire to join NATO and the European Union, and this is simply intolerable for him and for his view of what Russia is. And so he has this desire also not just to change things in Ukraine, but a desire to correct the whole post-Cold War international order uh, in Europe. In other words, that in these the draft treaties that the Russian foreign ministry published in December, was, there was one uh, uh, not only about Ukraine demanding you know, neutrality and never joining NATO, but with regard to Europe, that, that uh, you know, uh, troop deployments be, be uh, uh, taken away from everything from 1997 onwards, in other words, deployments in Eastern Europe, that he expects people to agree to this. Now, you know, I guess sort of the question is sort of why now, or why make such a, a fuss of this right now? And it's not exactly clear why, but it does seem that, that you know, unlike the Chinese, who, you know, looking forward, they can sort of see an even better future, even richer future for themselves. For, for Putin, looking at Russia's future, it doesn't look so good. Russia is experiencing demographic decline, uh, economic decline, in other words, that they haven't really developed their economy past petroleum sector, some sectors have developed, but they haven't done you know, the, the Chinese transition from a communist to a you know, modern economy has been quite remarkable. The Russians simply haven't done this. And for an economy that depends on petroleum exports in a world that's moving away from petroleum, this is not good for Russia going forward. So uh, you know, he, the political trends don't favor Russia. Therefore, if he's going to act, probably now is the time to have done it. I can't tell you why this is the exact time, but I think that part of it has to do with 
there are some who speculate that when Trump was in power, he really believed that Trump would withdraw uh, the U.S. from NATO, and then, of course, Europe would be left on its own uh, with Russia. The fact that you have uh, you know, Biden who's come in, who has emphasized commitment to NATO, this was not what he wanted to hear. All right, so he's invaded. What did he think was going to happen? Uh, it seems that he, he seemed to think that it'd be over and done with pretty quickly. Uh, and his previous uses of forces have been fairly successful. In any event, what he clearly undermet, underestimated was the strength of Ukrainian nationalism. The Ukrainians are resisting. I had in, in my Russian security policy class a professor from Vladivostok speaking not three weeks ago who Russia was not going to invade Ukraine. If it did, there would not be significant Ukrainian resistance because the Ukrainians just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do that. Obviously, that was a misunderstanding. Putin also underestimated the Western reaction, it seems to me, that I think he was counting on European countries not being willing to confront Russia. And what we've seen is that they, they have. And finally, I think he overestimated the ability of Russian forces uh, to accomplish the job. Now, as I said, previous uses of Russian of, of force has been successful, whether in Chechnya, just after 1999, even when Putin was prime minister, in Georgia in 2008, over and done in a few days, Crimea, you know, they seized it practically without firing a shot, 2014, Eastern Ukraine, there's been an insurgency, but essentially on Russia's terms, it's been more or less frozen. Obviously, Ukraine hasn't gotten this territory back. And Syria, they've done a remarkable job. It, was, you know, it appeared that the Assad regime was about to fall, even with Iranian and Hezbollah support. The Russian uh, intervention uh, has uh, turned it around at very little human cost to Russia at, at, at that. And so I think that, you know, if, if how he looks at his past experience, he's been pretty successful. Uh, but what we've seen is that this has not happened. And what, what has happened is that the Russian military has exhibited the same performance that it did in the 2008 Georgia war. So you might say, well, what do you mean? Because they won. But even Russian military observers, Pavel Felgengauer in particular, used to talk about how it was a good thing that they were fighting such a small adversary because if they weren't, it, the, the Russian forces did not do very well in that war. And what happened was that a huge you know, modernization program was launched afterwards, acquire new modern weapons, you know, training the Russian forces constantly to, uh, to improve. And yet what we've seen in Ukraine is that they're not necessarily performing any better than they did in Georgia, uh, that all this money and effort seems to have been fairly much wasted. Uh, and so his modernization just didn't, didn't work. Now, that doesn't mean they won't overcome eventually like they did in Georgia, but that this, this was not, I think, what he wanted to do. Now, just in terms of possible consequences, I, I think what's, what's amazing is that Vladimir Putin has accomplished what several American presidents have been unable to accomplish, and that is get the European allies to spend significantly more on defense spending. They, they, Vladimir Putin has done that. It's really quite remarkable. Uh, another consequence is Russia's further economic isolation from the West. That, that although obviously it's not stopping what he's doing in Ukraine now, that, that as time goes on, you know, you need to have economic strength to underpin military strength and the sanctions that we put on very much make this more difficult for Russia to do. So in, other words, in sort of the long game that Russia uh, is not benefiting. Um, is, and, and, and the other thing that, that may be happening is that with all this uh, economic isolation from the West, Russia might become more and more dependent on China. And certainly lots of Russians that I know don't think this is a good idea. It's very interesting. I had another speaker talk about how they give this uh, uh, period of honeymoon between Russia and China about 15 years, in other words, until the time Putin may finally leave office. But that with China's economic, you know, China's might growing and China's being sort of nasty to all its other neighbors and not Russia, that eventually they will turn on Russia as well. And I see I'm getting, my, I'm almost done here. Um, also, Putin's inability to uh, subdue Ukraine now could lead to other problems, increased opposition inside Russia. Uh, now, obviously, he has forces to crack down on this, provided that they remain loyal. 
But what he has inflicted on his own military is, is pretty painful. And it strikes me that what he is now vulnerable to a uh, uh, military overthrow. My conclusion, just very briefly, Putin's invasion of Ukraine could well be the beginning of the end for Putin. Uh, and I just think that you know he, he, he did not know what he was getting into. He thought it would be easy. And uh, it, it has not been. And with that, I'll move. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Um, why don't I explain just briefly what the lay of the land is. We have our speakers in two groups, and we'll have a break for about 15 minutes of discussion with you all uh, in between. So what we have now next, after uh, thinking about Putin, who was actually you know the one who started this war, uh, we're very lucky to have Janine Waddell talk about Ukraine's political culture for five to six minutes. We will then turn back to Fairfax. Mike Hunsiger will give us a brief assessment of the battlefield as it looks now. Um, and then we will uh, invite our two, uh, we're very, the Shar School is very lucky to have two Ukrainian scholars in residence with us. Uh, we'll have Anton Liagusha, who works on disinformation questions, and Maria Panga, who's a PhD student here. Uh, they will make their remarks, and then we will take questions from the group uh, at about 10 of 7, we'll then switch to a second short panel uh, with some additional speakers. Okay, we on the Arlington side are actually going to flash a sign to our speakers when they have one minute left. Okay, thank you all. Do you want me to come out yes, here? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, and, and if you could give me some benchmarks even before then. Okay. That would be great. Thank you so much. You're so, <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, Four I'll sit down. Four and a half. All right. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I have been going to, um, as, a, as a, an anthropologist and East European um, specialist, I've been going to Ukraine since uh, the early 90s, and in fact did a year there recently, 2015 and 2016, under a Fulbright uh, Fellowship and had the opportunity to teach. And last, a week when I was cleaning out my office and Ellen stopped by and saw the mess that it was. In that, you know, does mountains of work, I found papers, I found students from papers from students from those years and remembered what they had written about and and thought about what are these people doing now. Um, and, and many of them, no doubt, are on the front, the, the, the men are no doubt on the front lines. Some of the women are no doubt also on the front lines and others may have, may have fled to the West. When I was teaching there in 2015 and 2016, it was just a year after the, the so-called Maidan, the Revolution of Dignity. Maidan is spelled M-A-I-D-A-N. That's the revolution that, um, that began after Viktor Yanukovych, the then prime minister, uh, decided not to sign the association, the, the, uh, the EU-Ukraine association agreement, which would have brought Ukraine closer to the West um, and indeed adopted to go with the Russian option of the uh, European Economic Union. And this led to a revolution, which led to the overthrow of what many would call a puppet-led government in Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych, who then fled to Russia with his billions of dollars looted from the, uh, from the Ukrainian um, um, people. Um, and a new government, a uh, democratically elect government, was, was, was formed in this um, huge, uh, European country of major consequence. As you probably know, it's the second largest country in Europe by area with 41 plus million people before many fled. So what should you know about Ukrainian people and political culture? Well, in reflecting on this, it occurred to me that what we should know is precisely what Russian propaganda wants us not to think. And there are four things that, that came to, four issues that came to mind. 
um, that need to be understood and that the Russian propaganda machine has sought for the past decade to, to, to dispel. And I've been studying this uh, a bit. I am on um, list serves on both the, the left and the right. And what is so interesting is that we see the same propaganda points in the uh, propaganda, the, in the talking points of the listservs in parts of the left and parts of the right. So what should we know that Russian propaganda machine does not want us to understand? Well, so Russian propaganda machine wants us to think that Ukrainians have no history, culture, identity as Ukrainians, um, that there really, there is no there there in Ukraine. That's, that's what, uh, Talk, the talking points um, um, allude to. And as an anthropologist, I know that, that, that the first thing you do if you want to do dehumanize people, discriminate against them, wage war against people, the first thing you do is say they don't have any culture, they don't have any history, they're not really people. And that's exactly what we see happening in, in the Russian case. In fact, um, this could not be further from the truth. Kiev, the capital of Ukraine, was established long before Moscow. Eastern Orthodox Christianity was established in Kiev in the 1900s, before Moscow was, was, was even formed. And unlike Russia, for instance, 900s. Ukraine, sorry? 900s? 1900s. 1900s. What did I say? 1900s. 900. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, disinformation. Yeah, thank you for that correction. So, yeah. Um, so even if you're tr not trying. <laughs> so, so, and unlike Russia, Ukraine has a robust tradition of civil society and consciousness of shared public space. We saw this in the Maidan. We saw this in the aftermath of the Maidan when I... Um, lived in Kiev in, in 2015, 2016, there were pianos all over the city as there were in many public spaces in, in throughout Ukraine and professional pianists and you know rock stars would come and perform on them and people would gather around and sing and play and make music together and you could make requests. Um, so, so it has a robust history of civil society, high level of education. Ukraine, Ukrainian identity has been bolstered, in fact, by, by the invasion in the uh, Crimea, in the East, annexation of Crimea, and, the, um, and, and uh, the creation of the separatist enclaves in 2014. Many, would, many people told me that I never knew how Ukrainian I really was until the Russians intervened. Second Russian propaganda point, very briefly, that we need to dispel is that the that the uh, that the Ukraine conflict is a civil war between people who are Russian speakers and Ukrainian speakers, and in fact, virtually everyone in the country understands at least understands both languages, and they're used interchangeably. So Russian is traditionally the language of business. Ukrainian is the language of of the state. And often if you're going for an appointment, you can hear them asking in the background or asking you directly, now, do you prefer Ukrainian or Russian? Do you prefer to be spoken to in Ukrainian or Russian? So, so it is, it's, this, is, this issue has been blown up and exacerbated by Russian propaganda in social media, et cetera. Very briefly, third Russian, prop third Russian propaganda uh, talking point is that Ukrainians are a bunch of Nazis. This is preposterous. The president of, of Ukraine is, is, is Jewish, as are many of the elites, people in prominent positions. Um, Nazis occupy no more, Nazi bands occupy no more um, uh, public positions, do not occupy, uh, have no place in, in Ukrainian political culture, and there are more, no more of them, Nazi bans in Ukraine than in any Western European country or the United States. Unlike Russia, Ukraine is where there's no succession plan after Vladimir Putin. Ukraine is actually a functioning democracy. 
I'm, I think I'm out of time. No, yes. Okay. So there's one more. We can get to that later if you're interested. It has to do with corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to Mike. All right. Uh, can you hear me over there, uh, Ellen? Yes. Yeah, I think it's on and it's plugged in. I'm not tech savvy. All right. So I've got 10 minutes of comments, but I promise I'll cram them into six. My undergraduates know I can do it. Uh, so I know it's bad practice, speaking wise, to start off by telling you what I'm not going to tell you. But it's also bad practice to invade another country or to do it with only 150,000 troops. So bad practice is clearly the name of the game and who am I to say otherwise. So I should be clear, I'm not going to take my comments about the battlefield operations in Ukraine right now to dive into the weeds of tactics and operational maneuvers that are playing out in real time before our very eyes. I get the temptation to do it. Twitter and TikTok make us feel like we're right there. God forbid when the world has its first Oculus War. But I think we need to remember that we are not there right now. We might be watching events unfold in real time, but as my astute PhD RA Mike Sweeney put it to me, we are doing so through a straw. And I would add to that, that straw is one of those bendy ones you give to your kids because Ukraine is putting on a masterclass of information warfare. In any case, although I have thoughts as someone who studies the evolution of warfare and who has actually participated in an invasion, I'm still not sure I'm qualified to comment authoritatively. The fact is I follow Rob Lee, Mike Coffin, and that dude who tweet storms about the lack of maintenance of Russian tires, just like everybody else. So instead of doing a map of the earth deep dive into the literal trenches that are evolving on the front in Ukraine, let me instead channel my inner Peter King, he's a sports guy, uh, and give you three things I think I think at this very early stage of a conflict that I worry is going to turn into a hurting stalemate. First, I think I think it is way too early to venture a guess as to how the fight plays out. And I think you should unfollow anyone that claims otherwise. Other than agreeing with the pundit class that the war has entered a deadly new phase, I don't think we have enough reliable information to make an informed guess as to what comes next. Remember, we are still in the first minutes of the first quarter of a game that will not end until both sides agree that it does. So it's way too early to tell whether we're dealing with the Patriots-Falcons Super Bowl type of war or a Giants-Patriots Super Bowl type of war. And the fact is the trend lines seem to point in both directions. On the one hand, as Professor Katz aptly pointed out, the Russian military is clearly not what we thought it was. Although scholars have been saying for years that we should stop acting like the Russian military is 10 feet tall, I don't think any of us expected, again, viewed through the lens of Ukrainian social media, uh, to see the level of incompetence that we seem to be seeing at every single level, tactical, operational, political, strategic. Putin's YOLO shock and awe campaign to open the war really was puzzling. And at this point, it seems that Russia has committed all the combat forces it amassed for this operation, which represent a majority of its combat forces overall, yet the numbers it's bringing to bear are grossly inadequate to defeat, occupy, and subdue a hostile population of 44 million. But by committing so much of his military power to Ukraine, Putin seems to have left himself dangerously exposed to crises elsewhere. And at the operational and tactical levels of war, the Russian military just keeps making strange, if not bad, choices. Where are its drones? Where is its air force, for that matter? The dearth of long-range precision-guided munitions, I get it, never had that many of them. But why in the world did Moscow not make Ukraine go dark in the opening phases of the conflict? And what's going on with those massive lumbering convoys when Russia still lacks air superiority, let alone air dominance? And clearly, Ukraine's military and territorial defense forces are giving Russia a painful reminder that the enemy has a say in the outcome. That's the good news. Now for the bad news. On the other hand, I think the pundit Twitter class has set the bar too high for what an invasion looks like. Invading another country is hard. If Putin thought he could defeat Ukraine's military and topple its government in a matter of days, it really wasn't as brilliant as we thought. But the converse is also true. Anyone who thinks that Russia's military should have prevailed by now and takes its failure to do so as evidence that it will ultimately lose does not fundamentally understand warfare. The world has forgotten what large-scale ground combat looks like and how nasty and brutish it is. We lull ourselves into a dangerous place if we talk about great power competition and imagine that 2003 or 2008 or 2014 somehow represents the norm of what this will look like on the battlefield, let alone the worst case scenario. So let me remind you, the British Army lost 50,000 soldiers in 24 hours, the Battle of the Somme. The French and the German armies lost 1 million soldiers in a few months of fighting for a few fortresses around Verdun. By the same token, we shouldn't forget, even though I did, Mike Sweeney had to remind me of this, it took the vaunted Wehrmacht, Wehrmacht in the Second World War a month, a month to subdue Belgium and six weeks to rout France. In any case, having been part of the armored spearhead into Iraq in 2003, I keep asking myself what the world would have said about the US military if our invasion had played out on Twitter. So let, you re let me remind you of things you may not have been alive to see. It took us 15 days just to get to Baghdad. 
and another six days to subdue a city that didn't actually resist us. I lost half my platoon to maintenance failures between Kuwait and Baghdad. We ran out of food a week into the invasion. My platoon of 15 vehicles expended my battalion's entire allocation of ammunition in just three days of fighting. Our tactical formation involved 60 tanks and armored vehicles driving a diddle diddle straight up the middle on a highway for days on end, basically shooting at everything that moved. And by the time we got to Baghdad, we were towing half of our vehicles behind us while mechanics stripped them for parts in the middle of a firefight. And again, the resistance that we faced in 2003 was just a fraction of what the Canadian military is putting on. So let's keep that in perspective. Second, I think, I think we should be very worried about nuclear escalation. I'm waiting for Professor Katz and other Russia experts to tell me I'm wrong, and I would gladly grab that. I'm not quite ready to run for the hills of Montana, but I think a colleague I trust on these matters put it well when he said we are currently in the midst of the most dangerous nuclear crisis since October 1962, and only time will tell if it ends up being worse. I get the argument that Russians like the theater that comes with rattling the nuclear saber. I get the rational arguments that it makes no sense to escalate to the nuclear level. But I also take very seriously the equally rational literature on the stability and stability paradox and why it can actually make perfect rational sense to escalate to the nuclear threshold or just beyond it whilst expecting us to be the ones to back down. And I also take very seriously the rational literature on costly signaling, which suggests that when an actor sends a costly signal, they otherwise would not have sent unless they're really serious about the threats they're making, we should take those threats very seriously. In any case, given how few of us thought that Putin might actually invade just a few weeks ago, I'm not so comfortable dismissing the nuclear sword as mayor bluff and bluster for two other reasons. First, and again, I defer to actual Russia experts, but I don't see how Putin survives a failure. To the degree that he conflates his survival with Russia's survival, that leads to a dangerous place where our conventional success leads to his nuclear escalation. Second, I know that we don't think that we're at war with Russia, but I'm not sure it matters what we think so long as Putin thinks that we're at war with Russia. And when it comes to nuclear escalation, his perception, at least right now, matters more than our perception. The fact is, although we like to think of some clear-cut distinction between war and peace, I think that's a particularly Western view of things, and our various economic and financial efforts, our direct support of Ukraine's military, suggests that we are much deeper into the gray zone than we might be willing to admit to ourselves. Given that Putin is already inclined to see boogeyman looking, lurking in the shadows, I don't know how much of a pretext he will need to convince himself to take it to the next level if he starts losing at the conventional one. Finally, I think there are actually some useful and dare I even say positive or at least helpful lessons we can glean from the tragedy thus far. First, I think the war in Ukraine will finally force us to wake up from our way too long post-Cold War daydream that wars of conquest were passe like a relic of a bygone era. I've always found this view dangerously misleading, but once great power competition log roll really started to roll, I was worried that this collective delusion might cause us to sleepwalk into a great power war under the false impression that great power competition would play out in a different way in the 21st century. Dare I say also that our allies and partners are waking up to this harsh reality too. The long-term implications of militarization and the pursuit of autarky are unclear. At least in the short run, I see positive ramifications. Second, I think that this shows that our years of hand-wringing about gray zone warfare and about NATO's lack of resolve and readiness actually paid off. We quickly reinforced our EFP battle groups. We're creating another one in Romania. We activated the VJTF and the NRF. NATO and the EU acted with a degree of speed and cohesion that none of us thought possible before the crisis. None of this happens before Ukraine in 2014, as Professor Katz pointed out, but also none of it happens without the years of hard work and painful introspection by NATO. Finally, I think the ongoing war helps us, for those of us who study warfare, put several unhelpful boogeyman concepts to rest. One of these is the idea that an adversary can take down a resolute target through gray zone and hybrid operations alone. If that were a possibility, I have no doubt Russia would have already done it. But as other scholars have made clear years ago, that approach is only viable in a few places. Ukraine is clearly not one of them. And I think at this point, we can say Taiwan and others are not one of them as well. The same goes for our fear of a fait accompli invasion. I've been trying to beat this drum for years now, but no notice innovations aren't a thing. That's just not how war works. At least not if you intend to attack a country that is ready to defend itself. Simply put, you cannot hide an invasion force that is big enough to actually invade anyone that requires invading. It takes months to amass that kind of combat power. Until Putin or Xi develops some sort of deus ex tesseract mahina, they will have to settle for an increasingly implausible denial cover story or a manufactured crisis. We admittedly kind of sort of fell for that in the lead up to this war, but I really truly think we will not make that same mistake again, which of course is a scholar of the First World War leads to other potential problems down the road, but let's just take one more at a time. Uh, thanks so much. So we're going to now segue from three very sharp kind of analytic perspectives from academics 
to two deeply human perspectives, I hope. Uh, we are really honored to have two people who can tell us in much more vivid detail uh, the perspective of Ukrainians, even though they are not obviously in, in their country now. I'm going to just ask you, Anton and Maria, if you could just say a few sentences about your own backgrounds, where you're from, since many of us uh, have not had the opportunity to meet you yet. So feel free to introduce yourself first before you make your uh, remarks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so sorry for my Ukrainian English, and of course, at this time, I would like to, to speak in Ukraine, but I, am, uh, I understand that you, you can understand my native language. I would, uh, firstly, <clears throat> I have to say that uh, now uh, Ukrainian, um, Ukrainians don't use uh, calendar and weekdays, of course. We use the end day of war, and today is a uh, certain day of war. And I have to know that all my beloved uh, ones um, in shelters in Kiev, fighting against enemy and uh, as my parents have bombed uh, in the Donetsk Oblast now and I have to say that um, in 2014 um, I knew uh, I knew it comes not only but uh, for sure this war really comes from 2014 and when Russia came to my home Donetsk and uh, forcing me to leave my home. Uh, but nobody abroad, absolutely nobody, uh, believed me when I said that Putin wants to occupy my home country. And uh, why, all the time I ask myself, why nobody abroad um, believe me? Um, it's easy because Russia um, state create a so powerful for that for that time, not for for today, a system of propaganda. But uh, to my mind, uh, is a main wrong of Russia propaganda is they creating propaganda using old methods in the new environment. Uh, because today we always seen Orwellian world uh, and from today if you know in russia schools teachers have to teach um pupils what is a fake news and from today uh real news in russia it's only news what authority says it's only official news it's only um any statement or any information uh, from government, from authorities, uh, from president. But uh, Putin, of course, he is a former officer KGB, and of course, he learned wrong history. And I have to say, wrong history, born wrong understanding of reality. It's the main point of this war, because Ukrainian history have has more than 300 years resisting against Russia empire in our history from national uh, national independence war in 17th century uh, so on so on so on till today all time especially last eight uh, eight years we're trying to count in we're trying to deconstruct Russian myths uh, for instance, uh, maybe you have know um, uh, how Russia trying to create some fakes about Ukraine. One of them, uh, one of the popular fakes was um, on July uh, 2014. It's a story about the uh, cruci uh, crucified boy. Yeah, you know about this story. Uh, a week after Ukrainian troops had liberated the city of Slavyansk and Donbass, Russia's Channel One TV ran a story on the evening news about Kalina Prushnyak, a woman who allegedly fled from this city after the arrival of the armed forces of Ukraine. The story told by the woman was applying Ukrainian soldiers allegedly took a little boy who was dressed only in shorts and crucified him like Jesus. 
it's a very famous story. It's Christomatically story, I have to say. Uh, why? Because this story, it was one of the based main based um, issues or poems of Russia propaganda creating Ukrainian Nazis, people who even don't uh, believe in God and who even uh, crucified little uh, babies, a, little, a child like Jesus. It's, uh, of course, um, it's unbelievable since, but uh, many years, um, many Western media supported, supporting Russia, Russian propaganda narrative about Ukraine, a failed state. It's not true. Russia all time tried to uh, explain why Ukraine is not state, why Ukraine is people without any uh, own identity, why Ukraine uh, it's not about um, independence, so on, so on, so on. And many, uh, many people who, who haven't know history, who, who don't know history, who didn't know history, I'm so sorry, uh, absolutely don't understand what's going on and why uh, Ukraine is not a real state. And of course, uh, I have so much uh, counting, so much uh, accounting uh, types of Russia propaganda against Ukraine, but this war it's not war of putin uh against ukraine this war for sure it's war of history uh this war uh, uh is war of sense of senses of identity of values it's really it's true because now uh, many hundreds of years russia uh, russian people try and uh uh to believe themselves as a uh, people who above other people. You have no, we have a special Russia vodka, we're so brave, we have a so big army, we have a nuclear power, and so on, so on, so on. We have so big history, we have so big culture, we have Tolstoy Dostoevsky, but uh, it's it's like it's like a trying to, cr uh, to create a crazy uh, chauvinistic myth about their own nation. And it's so dangerous in 21st century. But I hope, of course, uh, Russia will be a failed state because I have to emphasize they creating uh, now their own propaganda using old methods in the new environment. And Ukraine now, it is really a new environment. I absolutely know how many people now fighting in information uh, front, uh, in cyber front, what are they doing on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, and uh, of course, NATO, of course, invisible, uh, collective invisible enemy, West, it's only, it's only one, one, no, not only one, but it's since in, in Putin mind. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, it's like a threat, creating a threat for Russian people who have no any any comfortable scenes for their own lives. That's why uh, they all need to be uh, uh, they, they all need fighting against uh, against people who would like to live happy life, who would like to be uh, mm, who would like to be. Uh, mm, independent who would like to think using their own mind and etc 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 of course to my mind it's like a last time uh, of existing on the one hand of Russia empire on the other hand USSR because because it's a result of USSR uh, collapse today unfortunately unfortunately and of course I believe that uh, our brave defenders, um, I don't believe, I absolutely assure our defenders do all possible and uh, we will win this war. Slava Ukraini, glory Ukraine. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Maria. I'm first year PhD student in public policy here in Shire School. Uh, I prepared the speech because um, I, I might 
might might go too emotional so please don't judge me <laughs> if i will um, um and i have been working for the past five years for the for the ukrainian central bank i'm an economist um i came to the united states some, seven months ago um i cannot e express all the anger frustration despair and fear that i have been experiencing for the past two weeks Every morning, I'm texting my family members and friends to check if they are still alive. They are living in bomb shelters for almost two weeks. All Ukrainians are fighting against Russia, against Putin every single second. I want to tell you about my friend Hanna, who has been working as an investment banker in Kiev. And now she is voluntarily manages the delivery of bulletproof vests from Europe and the United States. I want to tell you about my friend Rihori, who received his MBA at Columbia University. And almost two weeks ago, he joined the Territorial Defense Forces in Odessa. I want to tell you about my former colleagues from the Ukrainian Central Bank who left their jobs and signed to the Ukrainian army. I want to tell you about my five-year-old niece who tells uh, younger kids in the bomb, shel bomb shelter, don't be afraid. It will be over soon. Russian missiles are killing Ukrainians right now in every in, in this uh, minute and second. Russia has been bombing our largest cities with a population on average more than one million people. The US and NATO refuses to shelter our skies. For the past 20 days, at least 38 children were killed and at least 71 were wounded. Three years ago, 18 months old boy dies after shelling in Mariupol. In 1994, Ukraine gave up the world's third largest nuclear arsenal in exchange of guarantees from the United States, Russia, and Britain, quote unquote, to respect the independence and sover sovereignty and the existing borders of Ukraine and, quote unquote, to refrain from the threat or use of force against the country. Ukraine has fulfilled its part of the agreement, agreement, believing that all countries will honor their guarantees in future. It is clear that both the international policy and international law experience a severe crisis for the past eight years since Russia invaded and annexed Crimea. The design of similar international agreements has to be reviewed because they simply don't work. It was believed that nuclear weapons can induce stability and decrease the chances, the, the chances of crisis escalation in the world. Now, a former KGB officer, Putin, blackmails with his nuclear weapon the whole world, including this great country, the United States. President Biden and NATO are afraid that if they decide to shelter the Ukrainian sky from Russian missiles, Putin will start the third war. In Putin's world, it is, has already started. On February 27, the main Russian propagandist, Dmitry Kisilov, said during his primetime show on the federal TV channel, quote unquote, Russian submarines are capable of firing more than 1,000 nuclear warheads. It is enough to destroy the United States and all NATO countries. And then Dmitry Kisilov asked, why do we need the world if there is no Russia in it? Thank you. Um, Eric, I wonder if you, uh, we're now, the floor is open for maybe 10 minutes and then we'll move to the second shorter panel. I uh, wonder if there's any questions from Fairfax, we can go back and forth. But I invite the group here in Arlington, including in our spillover room that has a couple of people in it, uh, if you have any questions or comments for any of our speakers, now's your chance. Yes, please. Thank you. My question is to the professor here. Do uh, uh, you think there is any possibility that uh, Putin is going beyond Ukraine to the NATO members? Is, is he going to cross the line to, for example, Baltic states, Poland, under any justification in the future? 
Uh, could you all hear the question? Yes. I think it's for Mark. Let's just put it this way. I think that if he had hoped to swallow Ukraine and then move onward, I don't think that's possible now. I think that, in other words, he, he, he's fairly coping with Ukraine. I don't think he has the capacity to to successfully uh, take over any other countries at the moment. So I, I don't see that happening now. Any questions here in Fairfax? I'm not sure we all caught the full question. The, the question is, how do you punish a leader who sits on top of a regime with nuclear weapons? And I think that's exactly the, the challenge that we confront right now is not only, I, actually, and again, I would ask my colleagues, I, I don't think punishment is the near-term problem right now. Right now, I think, number one, deterrence, and then number two, shifting to compellence to begin pushing back ultimately out of Ukraine. I think those are going to be problematic enough given this risk of nuclear escalation. I think if we could get to the world of how we can now hold Putin and the regime accountable, that would be a, a relatively good place to be compared to where we're at. But if I had answers, I would have written the Nobel winning book on that question by now. <laughs> Although I think you could argue that the uh, severity of the sanctions is at least partly an impulse to, to punish. Uh, we're, you know, we're signaling our disapproval, even if it does not immediately change his behavior, it is a form of punishment. Unfortunately, it's not punishment just against the leaders, it's also punishment against uh, the Russian people. So. Ellen said just what I was, thank you. Yeah. Other questions or, yes, please. Um, so I think that your point about um, uh, Putin's propaganda and a, um, Putin is using old world propagandas in, in a new world environment is absolutely spot on. Um, and my question is, we see a little bit about this idea of possibly, you know, there's dissension behind the scenes within the Russian government. And this question is directed to anybody. Um, what are the chances that these oligarchs who are seeing severe like financial punishments right now have some sort of palace coup or have some sort of uh, revolts against Putin's war, maybe even against Putin himself. Did you all hear the question? We did. We did. Yep. Uh, Anton? Mm -hmm. sure. um, close circle of Putin, so afraid of Putin, for sure. Absolutely afraid. And as I know, uh, today, one person from Moscow said to me that never in parliament and in cabinet, never uh, uh, in Russian history, weren't so uh, united uh, thoughts of supporting Putin. Because uh, these people uh, absolutely understand now that they will be um, will be under, under the law, I mean, they will be uh, um, no victims uh, response for for this for, for responsible yeah for for this uh, uh, for this events for this war that's why um, I I really don't think don't don't think that uh, billionaires or millionaires who of course now losing their own billions of course uh, so in early. In early, early days, I mean, tomorrow or next week, uh, we'll try to, to kill him, for instance. No, no. unfortunately, it's, it's my own. 
And uh, if, if I may add, another problem is that not all Russian oligarchs uh, were sanctioned. This is this is how it's going there. I, I don't know if you heard that Maria said that not all oligarchs were sanctioned. So, yeah. Just a quick two finger on the sanction question. I, I would agree that from the Western perspective, we have long liked sanctions because it allows us to do something short of the kinetic use of force. Uh, but just to reiterate the degree to which we are weaponizing sanctions, and I think quite effectively and remarkably, I, I believe is unprecedented. And therefore, we just have to be open and very sensitive to a couple of, I think, dilemmas. One of which is, it strikes me that we really have cut Putin off from his piggy bank. That's going to challenge his ability to make war, which brings us into the, does conventional defeat, is this a failure he can survive? Is there a way he can compromise and walk back what he's already done? The other piece we run into is a classic problem when you attempt to compel and punish, which is how do you assure the other side you're going to stop? And some of these things, I don't know that we're going to be able to quickly turn off the political will that it took to turn them on in the first place. And given the severity, and the widespread nature and the fact that authoritarian regimes tend to be pretty good at making sure punishment directed at them is felt by the people, that could put us in a very tricky world. Again, relative to some of the worlds we could be in a good one to be in, but still things we should be attuned to. Any last questions on the Fairfax side and then we'll switch. Okay. Uh, we have a ton of questions over here. Um, but I'll, <laughs> why would you rotate that? Uh, yeah, so I think you had the last question in Arlington, is that right? Okay. Thank you. Um, there's an increasing amount of calls uh, for no fly zone, especially from some members of Congress. Um, how concerning is this to you? And do you think that Biden would ever actually um, consider this? Yeah, we didn't hear the question. And I wonder if that's a topic that we're going to get to on the second panel when Rich Kozlerich talks about diplomacy. We'll be talking about U.S. policy a little bit more. Yeah, Ellen, um, I don't know if you can hear me now. It's a quite, it was a question about the no-fly zone. Why don't we hold that for the second panel? Okay. Well, back to you on your side, Ellen. Okay, so um, one more question on this side, and then I'm going to suggest in the shortness of time we get the last four short presentations, and then the final round of questions can cover anything, if that's all right with you. Uh, Will? Um, yes, yeah, so in this moment, I'm reminded of First one is in the Cuban Missile Crisis, they called the blockade of quarantine because the blockade was an act of war. At what point do we consider um, basically the it's sanctions that we're doing the equivalent of a blockade? And then how does Putin, if he considers it a blockade, how does he not consider it an act of war? All right, so interesting question, but again, I think it belongs in the second round, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, uh, we'll ask the question of in the Cuban Missile Crisis, we know that the US uh, decided to call the blockade of Cuba, um, a quarantine, so that it wouldn't be seen as an act of war. Putin is now playing with what is Casas Belli. He's, you know, saying that economic sanctions are an act of war. So, um, I, if you can just hold up, maybe Rich and I will get to that in in our short presentations, um, unless somebody wants to make a quick response to that. Mm -hmm. Eric, you okay if we switch to the yeah. second panel? Let's um, go ahead. Do you want to go first? Um, Eric is going to give us five minutes on um, the um, the st how this this war relates to some of the experiences of the other former Soviet republics, and then we'll go to the three of us. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll actually try to be relatively short because I we have a lot of questions over here, Ellen. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, I'll try to summarize my main points. Um, so the, the question that I want to address is uh, why, why aren't, say, Central Asian states uh, lining up behind Putin, whereas we say a country like uh, Belarus lining up behind Putin? Right? So why, why this variation in post-Soviet support, particularly for states that are often perceived as clients of Moscow? Uh, and just to set the stage, um, it seems like, you know, this was ages ago, but in January, Russia actually intervened somewhere else. Russia in, intervened in Kazakhstan, right? Russia sent troops to Kazakhstan, uh, ostensibly to put down uh, foreign terrorists, uh, but actually to support uh, President Takayev as he was facing protests within Kazakhstan. Um, so you would think, right, that Kazakhstan would line up behind Moscow 
after the president of Kazakhstan essentially owes his job to Putin, but Kazakhstan hasn't. Nor for that matter, has any Central Asian country lined up to support what Russia is doing uh, in Ukraine. So it's a bit of a puzzle. Uh, and it's even more of a puzzle when you consider how dependent, how dependent Central Asian countries are on Russia. And I'll just, um, I had a bunch here, but let me just, in the, in, in, the, in the interest of time, let me just give you a few data points. Uh, Russia has military bases in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, quite substantial military bases. You think the, the Russian-Ukrainian land border is long? It's one third the size of the Kazakh-Russian land border. In fact, that's the largest land border in the world. And Russia has articulated intentions on taking over Northern Kazakhstan in the past. Uh, Steve Barnes is here. Uh, he could speak to this uh, in much greater detail. Uh, Solzhenitsyn has been some, you know, when he was alive was often saying, this is part of Russia. This should be part of Russia. So what we're seeing in Ukraine is not all that different than what Russia has been. Uh, you know, some people, nationalists in Russia have been intimating for, for Kazakhstan. Um, there, uh, you know, the, rest, the Russian Space Center is in Kazakhstan by Kanur. Um, remittances from Russia, from migrants working in Russia to Central Asia, constitute between one fifth and one third of many Central Asian economies, right? So the, the, the very economies of Central Asia are dependent on Russia. Um, the, Russian me the, the Central Asian media space is very similar to the Russian media space. So people in Central Asia are getting the same information that people uh, in Russia today are getting. So the question is why? Uh, why do Central Asian states, why are the leaderships of Central Asian states not lining up uh, against, uh, against, against um, are lining up in support of what Russia is doing in Ukraine? So I think it boils down to two things. Um, the first thing is Central Asia is not geopolitically important to Russia. So Central Asians can essentially do whatever they want to do because Russia is not concerned about what Central Asian leaderships think. They know that Central Asia has nowhere to go. They have no exit. They're not going to China. They're not going to Mongolia, right? They're, they're going to remain within Russia's sphere of influence. And so they're like the kids that the parents don't have to pay attention to. They don't have to say anything and the parents aren't going to get upset because they don't have to worry about Central Asia. And the Central Asian leaders know that. Central Asian leaders know that. Um, the other, I think, point to make is that the Central Asian leaders are not politically dependent on Moscow. Central Asian leaders come and go all the time. And you know what? Russia doesn't really step in, with the maybe exception of Takai, but I mean, Russia would have supported really anybody that would have backed Moscow. Russia lets the political instability unfold so no one in Central Asia really owes their position to Moscow. The president of Belarus owes his very survival to Moscow. Belarus has no choice but to support what Russia is doing. What, what Russia is doing. So when you look at the Central Asian space, you say these are countries that should be dependent on Moscow. Yet it's curious when you look at the recent UN vote, these countries did not vote against the denunciation of Russia. Uh, they don't have to because Russia, frankly, is not concerned about them. And the Central Asian leaders know that they don't owe their own political position to them. So with that, I'll stop. And I think, Ellen, we send it back to you. Next up is Professor Des Dynan, who's going to talk about Europe and European security institutions, perhaps. I'll talk about the European Union, if that's yeah, okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for those powerful um, personal testimonials. It's, it's hard to follow that. Um, the, the war in Ukraine has given the European Union a new <laughs> lease on life. Not, not that the European Union was moribund, by the way, but it was reeling from a succession of other crises. But this crisis is different. Of course, this crisis is not a new crisis. It's new in its scope. It's new in its escalation. But it's an old crisis going back to 2014, as we know, and in fact, before that as well. What's different now, of course, is the scale of what's happening, the implications of what's happening, the possible fallout from what is happening. What the crisis has given the European Union already remarkably in two weeks is a greater sense of unity, of solidarity, of cohesion, and a renewed sense of purpose. The war in Ukraine is reminding the European Union of what the European Union stands for, democracy, respect for rule of law, tolerance, fundamental rights. In other words, everything Putin opposes, which is exactly why 
as Janine mentioned, Putin opposed the conclusion of the association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union in 2013, which precipitated the events of 2014. So what has happened apart from that within the European Union? Well, as somebody who's been studying the European Union for a very long time, I'm struck, of course, by the rapidity of the European Union's response and the substantive nature of the European Union's response. In terms of rapidity, this will sound almost like a caricature of the European Union, but the number of meetings that have been taking place at the highest level is truly remarkable. Within the last three weeks, we've had three meetings of the European Council. The logistics of getting together all of the 27 leaders of the European Union's member states, plus its own institutional leaders, and the third of those meetings will take place, in fact, at the end of this week in, in Versailles under the French presidency of the Council. And at one of those meetings, an extraordinary meeting of the European Council on the 24th of February, President Zelensky participated remotely, obviously, and I cannot overestimate the impact of his presentation at that meeting, especially on Olaf Scholz, which in turn had a profound impact because it gave rise or contributed to, it wasn't the, the, the only reason, but it was a proximate cause for the speech which uh, Olaf Scholz made in the Bundestag the following Sunday, to which I will return. Other meetings, of course, of the Commission, numerous meetings of, of Council formations, and two extraordinary debates in the European Parliament, again, at one of which President Zelensky participated remotely. But what is the substance of the European Union's response? And, and I can go to this very quickly because I think we're familiar with it. Economic assistance for Ukraine, economic sanctions against Russia that are unprecedented and extraordinary, humanitarian assistance for refugees, visa facilitation for refugees, and military assistance for Ukraine. Yes, military assistance for Ukraine from the European Union, from something called the European Peace Facility, which is a fund of money available to the European Union, which has sat unused for years until now it's being used to provide arms to Ukraine. What are the policy implications? One is an acceleration of efforts within the European Union for the European Union to acquire a credible and effective military capacity. And that's where we come, of course, to Schultz, because this could not have happened without Germany reversing its foreign policy and its defense policy. What happened in the Bundestag when Olaf Schultz made that speech, and for which he received a standing ovation, by the way, amongst members of the Bundestag, his commitment to increasing the, 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 the budget on defense, a huge increase to, to building up the Bundeswehr, and to reversing decades of, of, of Germany's reticence to use force as an, as an instrument of, of foreign policy is, is truly profound. The European Union has been discussing the possibility of, of, of becoming a more credible um, defense actor, if you like, a military actor for a long time. President Macron has been pushing this. What we are going to see now is after the election in France, because Putin has, is helping Macron to get re-elected, by the way, is we're now going to have a re-elected Macron and a Chancellor Schultz, each of whom will have a long time to go in their mandates and will work very closely together in a way that French and German leaders have not worked closely together for a long time, and certainly in a way in which Macron and Merkel did not work closely together. And one of the main policy items on which they will work is exactly this, de developing a defense and military capacity for the European Union. Equally significant is the change in energy policy in the European Union. And we've seen evidence of that only today with a statement by, by Commission President von der Leyen. Another important development is the deepening in the ties between the European Union and the United States. This is very important because we know how badly frayed those ties were during the Trump administration. The extent of the collaboration between the United States and its European allies, and not only European countries, NATO partners, but the European Union as an institution has been truly remarkable. And, and by the way, and I'll say this parenthetically, the great fear is Trump's re-election or the election of a Trumpist who will reverse that, that coming together. Finally, lessons, reflections for the European Union. European Union needs to think, not just congratulate itself on the way in which it is receiving this huge number of refugees from Ukraine, but to contrast that with the way in which it received refugees in 2015 from other war-torn countries. And this is happening, by the way. 
I, I think there is within the European Union an awareness of, of the difference and, and a need for the European Union to be more generous in the future when it comes to other uh, refugee crises. Another reflection is on the utility of military force. I, I mentioned this already, but it's, it's very important to understand that the European Union has been grappling almost since its beginning with what it actually is. Is it a civilian power? Is it a normative power? Should it be, and this is a normative question, a military power? That debate is over. Um, and finally, I will just say, because this is very topical, what are the prospects for Ukrainian accession? Very long term. <laughs> there might be a symbolic statement recognizing Ukraine's special position as, a, as, a, as, as an aspirant for European Union membership, but membership in the European Union is an extremely complicated and, and time-consuming time process. And I will just mention one other thing, because it's, it's something that's not mentioned very often. The out, one of the outliers in Europe, in terms of the response, I don't know about a country, a country's response to what's happening is Serbia. Serbia is a candidate for European Union membership. Serbia's position in support of Russia and the public demonstration that took place in Serbia last Sunday in support of Russia has effectively made Serbian accession to the European Union impossible. Thank you. Well, I think that's a great um, segue to. I can give class. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much, Seth. Sorry to, to yeah. Perfect segue to uh, Rich Kozlovich uh, looking at US diplomacy and I think a little bit on energy as well. Right. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, really appreciate this opportunity and good to have the perspective of people whose lives are affected in ways that I think we can only imagine. <laughs> so um, that's all to, to you and to what you're what you're going through right now. Um, my background is in the area of diplomacy and intelligence, and I spent uh, three years as the U.S. ambassador in Azerbaijan, two years as the U.S. ambassador in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Fiona Hill and I briefed uh, President Bush uh, before the Bucharest summit about the uh, merits and demerits of uh, Hungarian, or sorry, of, of uh, Georgian and and. Uh, uh, Ukraine membership in NATO. So I've got kind of a broad spectrum here. When I think about that, what I think is most impressive to me is the Bosnian experience. Um, because what we see unfolding on a scale <laughs> 10 times worse is the siege of Sarajevo, uh, the loss of thousands of lives, the disruption of hundreds of thousands of refugees and displaced people. Uh, and the delay that the United States and Europe went through to get to the point where we finally intervened and um, brought about, I think, uh, the, uh, the end of the war, as, as Dick Holbrook wrote. So two, three things actually from that experience that I think are worth, worth thinking about. And I, I, I'm afraid that our Ukrainian friends aren't gonna be happy with me, but no fly zones without on the ground troop presence do not work. The no-fly zone in Bosnia uh, did not prevent Srebrenica, the genocide at Srebrenica from, from taking place. So we should not be under any illusions. No-fly zones sound great. A lot of, lot of feel good from the point of view of the people who are, who are um, operating them, but uh, in terms of protecting refugees, uh, they're just not in and of themselves uh, uh, that that significant. The second thing, I mean, the, the speed with which the U.S. and Europe have been moving on sanctions and everything is quite remarkable. Do you know there's a war crimes price proceedings that are starting now? The war is still on. We couldn't get that thing geared up in, in, uh, in the Balkans until after, after the conflict was over. So real time now, you know, we are building a case for war crimes against those who are responsible for what's going on in, in Ukraine today. Um, last point, people are thinking about post-conflict and reconstruction and all. And I heard the, the three words that I never want to hear again, a Marshall plan for, <laughs> you know, fill in the blank. 
um, it, it reflects a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Marshall Plan was about, but it also reflects a fundamental misunderstanding when we're on the other side of war, what the world's going to look like and what it's going to take to, to bring Ukraine um, and indeed others, you know, into what is a unpredictable situation. If somebody stands up here now and tells you, I know what's going to happen next, don't believe them. But I'll tell you some things that we, we really are going to have to work on next, which is starting with energy. Um, you know, I think Europe's, you know, my head is still spinning when I, I listen to, to German and French uh, politicians in particular say things about energy reducing dependence on, on Russia, gas in particular, maybe nuclear power. I mean, there are a whole set of issues out there. But, um, you know, we're seeing in our own country. Uh, that we're we're sort of having to recalibrate the whole question of where do we stand in terms of our dependency, particularly on fossil uh, fuels, but the reality that we're going to have to increase fossil fuel production in the short run. So, you know, this global energy market, watch for the Iranian negotiations. Um, it's very possible. Uh, I don't want to be too cynical that there will be extra incentives for the United States to reach an agreement with Iran because Iran is the one country that can put a lot of oil onto the global market very quickly. Um, second point, uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, supply chain disruptions, excuse me. Um, you know, Russia is the source of a lot of minerals that are very important for the U.S. and for, you know, uh, other economies as well. Uh, there's a food crisis brewing. Uh, because of Ukraine's uh, major role in in the agricultural area, particularly grains and and Russia's Russia's as well, I think there's going to be a big question about how international financial markets are are managed. Uh, there is the Fitch, I think, is is saying that that Russia is in technically in default right now. And when you think about an economy that large going into de default. You kind of have to ask yourself how can you how can you manage a system in the way that we've we've done so in the past um, i think we also need to to worry about nuclear nuclear not just the use of weapons but nuclear power now we've had you know several days where the russians have actually shelled nuclear power stations in ukraine thankfully nothing worse has happened but uh it does raise questions we're going to have to think about that dimension um, as well. Uh, and then last, I would say what I worry about in terms of Russian misbehavior is not so much with the Baltics, but with the Western Balkans, where with a very minor uh, amount of influence uh, on the Russian part, they can cause big problems, starting with Serbia, going to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then in the South Caucasus, where I guess I would disagree a bit with uh, with Eric on on this. I think Azerbaijan is a in the pocket of the Russians now and represents a, a an area that we really have to have to be concerned concerned about. Uh, so it's going to be a new world and how we how we adjust to it uh, is really going to be important. But a lot of the old tools and approaches that we that we took uh, during the Cold War period aren't going to work. Uh, thanks so much, Rich. Um, I'm just going to wrap up with a very brief uh, reference to the intelligence function and how it's contributed to this crisis. And then I think we'll turn it to Fairfax since you have some questions pending for our panelists. Um, so, you know, some crises are more driven by intelligence than others. Sometimes North Korea, there's, you know, suddenly revealed that there's a new plutonium or, you know, uranium processing plant, and that cr creates the crisis. This one we were watching in the sort of open space in terms of Putin's uh, intentions, his, his frustration and anger. But in addition, I think the role that US intelligence played uh, is quite unusual in several respects. And I think will, even if we don't like the outcomes, and we obviously right now are deeply uh, despairing and discouraged that we were not able to deter Putin. We were not he, in anticipation of all the pressure we put on him. It wasn't sufficient to get him uh, to rethink his his policy of war against 
Ukraine. But in its own kind of micro way, this will be seen as an intelligence success story, not an intelligence failure story, okay? This is an intelligence success story because the strategic intelligence was right. Uh, they were beating the drum for months and months that Putin had, you know, malign intention. Um, the Ukrainians themselves sometimes said, oh no, it won't be that bad, he won't do it. And the intel folks were consistently saying, he's going to do it, he's going to do it. Now, there might have been disagreements over, will he just stay in eastern Ukraine? Does he want to grab the whole country? There, certainly, your, your, your in, an assessment of those kinds of um, events are changing as more information comes in. But the second, so first, at the strategic level, the intelligence was high quality and the president grabbed it and believed in it. Second point is that the decision to go transparent, the decision to share the intelligence, not just with friendly countries, but with the whole world. I mean, the, the notion that we were willing to take the risk of compromising sources and methods because we believed that the, the transparency of intelligence had a chance to deny Putin the element of surprise. We were trying to disrupt his planning and the sharing of intelligence instead of holding on to it, which is what we usually do, and we only share it with people we trust, the sharing of the intelligence did was something that was a factor that at least it partly exacerbated or complicated his own plan. And then just the last point I wanna make is that I wonder if it's also a reflection of the fact that the current leadership of intelligence, Avril Haines and Bill Burns as the uh, director of the CIA, these are both people who have been in the White House and in the policy world. Bill Burns was ambassador to Russia and he's now director of the CIA. So you had people who were not only very attuned to what the policy debate was all about and comfortable with sometimes lowering that boundary between intel and policy to be useful, to be in the decision loop, if you will. But um, they brought deep personal expertise. So, you know, Burns playing the role of director of CIA, you can imagine him sitting with his Russia analysts and he was adding value and a trusted interlocutor uh, with the president as well as with um, other intelligence counterparts around the world. So not a happy ending yet for Ukraine and certainly it can't be a happy ending for quite some time. But in terms of the functions of parts of our national security system, I think this uh, worked reasonably well. And I think Rich might agree on the diplomacy side as well. Well, it made the yeah. diplomacy more effective. Yes. Because, yeah. you know, people, people were de dealing with the same basis right. for, for making their decisions. Right. So it's now 7.24. Uh, we've, we can stay in the room for an extra 10 or 15 minutes. But over to Fairfax for some questions, and then we'll, we'll circle back and forth. Are you able to hear me? Can you hear us? I don't know if, if the question is should. Uh, okay, you've got a handheld mic. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, for you guys to holding this event and for all the guest speakers that have spoken today. My question is that um, what place, if any, does America hold in terms of diplomacy um, with Russia and uh, what can American citizens do to aid people in Russia at this time? What was the first part of the question? Was it about U.S.-Russia policy? Um, yes. What place does America have, if any, in terms of diplomacy? Um, should we intervene? Can we intervene? Or uh, what can we do at this time? Maybe, Rich, do you want to take that? Yeah, oh, that's easy. Thanks. Um, <laughs> No, look, my, my starting point with diplomacy in, in all of this is that we're not dealing with a normal leader. In other words, we're not dealing with someone who represents interests of his country. And it makes it hard to negotiate when when you're not when you're not negotiating on, on the same level. And I think we you know we've used our diplomacy effective and effectively in building the alliance, trying to provide what support we can for Ukraine. But in terms of right now, until the war stops and Putin decides he's not going to pursue this military track, it's really hard to say that diplomacy 
U.S. Russia diplomacy really can get very far. And, okay. and I would add to that that sometimes denying the yeah. diplomatic encounter is a form of diplomacy. So when you know um, uh, when Tony Blinken said, "I don't want to meet with Lavrov," and you know there was a point at which he was dashing to Europe every five days right. to go and meet with Sergei Lavrov, and then he said, "I'm done. We're not meeting again." So that in itself is a diplomatic act. Uh, Alan, we have more over here, but I want to be cognizant of the fact that there's an audience in Arlington as well. So if there's a question in Arlington, please. Uh, why don't we just take another one from Fairfax and then. Sure. So um, thank you very much for coming. My question was kind of similar, and that is, what is the off-road for Putin look like? Is it a sort of a diplomatic approach or is it a show of force from the United States? Do we need to start deploying further troops to Poland, Romania, and does that also include air support and tanks? Is Mark Cat still on your end, or is Mark, Mark left? Mark had to go, but I think Mike may have some. He had to go to teach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Mark. Mark threw me that radioactive football. So it. Um, I think you're asking the right question. So the only the only thing I would add to the previous answer is we we. Feel like I'm the horrible person in the room here. We have to remember that war is diplomacy. It's just diplomacy using a language that horrifically we would prefer not to use and that hopefully one day we can hold the regime in Moscow responsible for using. But so we are engaged or if diplomacy is being engaged in right now, we are obviously using sanctions as well. And Ukrainian military and Ukrainian territorial defense forces are exercising diplomacy by other means. Uh, to that end, I, so ironically, I had a paper that we submitted the day before the invasion broke, in which we said that if the invasion breaks, that my take on it, and I'm writing this with a colleague in Europe, that it is and will be necessary, actually, even if the invasion didn't happen, just because of the bellicose nature of the buildup for us to significantly reinforce what we refer to as NATO's eastern flank, and especially to focus on some of the more vulnerable areas we had in thus far. I think it, when we wrote the piece, it was doubtful whether or not there would be support for that, yeah, certainly in parts of NATO that weren't on the eastern flank. I think now there's no question that's going to occur. And really, in some respects, and I defer to my colleagues who study European politics, the United States actually might be behind what Europe is going to be asking for and willing to do for itself. But I definitely think the Biden administration must think very hard, from my perspective, not in terms of what we can do in terms of intervening in the conflict right now directly, but in terms of shoring up our deterrence posture. And I think for the foreseeable future in Europe, certainly I think the already passed eight debates about it's time to cut the army to focus on the Indo-Pacific are done for. And we here in the United States should be willing to revisit a lot of our longstanding assumptions about military spending. And Congress has been working on this for some time, things like selective service. Yeah, uh, uh, Rich? Mm -hmm. right. Just on, on this point, I, I don't think we should uh, forget the damage that the Trump administration did to our relationships with NATO. And Europe has taken a, a lesson from that. And, and what, what Desmond described as, as the European initiative in the security area is only going to get stronger after this, no matter who the next US president is. And so th that's why I say we, we can't really go back to business as usual because it, it may look good now. We've got, you know, NATO's clicking on all 12 cylinders and we're working closely with the EU, but it's not going to go back to the old days of U.S. dominance of the right. security relationship that's NATO-based, it's going to be quite different. I'm going to just return to Will's question from before of, you know, when do you decide to go from, uh, you know, coercive measures related to force that are short of war, and when do you cross that threshold and sort of use means that have a warlike legal consequence to them? Um, it is very striking that the NATO Secretary General has said this is a defensive alliance. Um, you know, he's using a vocabulary that says there, we don't see the trigger yet where we would be, you know, obliged or authorized. It would have to be an attack on a NATO state. Strange, you know, in terms of the way I think some of the strategists at NATO understand the, the rules of NATO, if you will. And we also see President Biden saying, no boots on the ground, you know, we will do everything we can short of the things that are considered, you know, sort of escalatory. And now we have Putin saying, no, 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 this, e this economic warfare against us is war. 
And so it's a very, it's almost, it's both a philosophical and a legal debate as well as political of which of these measures constitute uh, hostile, you know, things that, that are virtually a state of war and not, uh, and that require further steps. So far, I think both NATO and the Biden administration think they know what the boundaries are and they want to stay within certain perimeters. But um, if Putin really wants a war with us, and I don't think he, he must not want a showdown completely, um, he, he could do some things that would force NATO to have to take further steps. Uh, Rich, did you want to? Well, I was yeah. just going to jump in. You know, it took us yeah. about three or four years in, in former Yugoslavia to, to kind of reach that point. But it was the trigger was not an attack on one of one of the alliance members. It was the Srebrenica right. uh, events and and the the shelling of the market in Sarajevo. I I worry that something similar. I mean, the scale of what's going on in Ukraine is unimaginable. But you know, a siege in, in Kiev. That goes on for, for days. So a human, the humanitarian yes. piece could to drive the decision. Right. Yeah. Mike, I don't know if you want to weigh in on that particular question of are we are we clear that, that we're short of uh, you know a, a legitimate cause of war here? I mean, just to to reiterate what I blitzkrieg through in my my comments, I. I believe that we're clearly short of that line. I believe that we believe we're clearly short of that line. I have confidence that smarter people than me who have access to information are clear. But part of me also just you know, takes very seriously Mark's point that much of this is going on inside the, man, the mind of one man, one man who has proven unpredictable, and ultimately he will be the arbiter of where that line is. And so my assumption is that we, are, we have contingency plans, flexible deterrent options, on the books, ready to go in case that misperception occurs on our end. Uh, but you know, there have been some long-standing debates about Russian nuclear doctrine, whether or not they have a what we refer to as an escalate to de-escalate doctrine. At, at, at a minimum, we know that they do think about nuclear weapons in a different way, and they have a much larger tactical arsenal than we have, which does give them some potential alternatives that we would find very difficult to counter. And I think given just the what we have seen play out thus far were one of those options to be used. It would be very difficult, I think, for us to, to back down to that point. Yes. So we've discussed the, the vulnerability to Putin of potentially being removed from power due to the execution of this invasion of, uh, of Ukraine. Should Russia ultimately prevail in Ukraine, does that vulnerability evaporate? And, or, or, excuse me, does that vulnerability persist and or does it evaporate you mean would putin still feel the need to go further is that what you is would the, he still feel is the vulnerability to for him being, yeah of being removed from power does that persist or does that go away uh, eric is that something you want to you want to take that one uh, yeah i think one thing that we know from from the study of, of authoritarianism is uh, we're often surprised, right? So these dynamics can often have a cascade effect. I think regrettably, as, as uh, um, our Ukrainian colleagues both suggested, uh, as far as vulnerability from the existing city, sitting elite, I think that's quite limited. Um, I thought President Zelensky was incredibly astute by appealing directly to the Russian people. I think that's where the challenge lies. I think there are many people in Russia who uh, disagree with this war. Um, and uh, if he is going to face a challenge, I think it's going to be on the streets and not in the inner halls of power. Hmm. Any more on your end? Did you, Kim, did you ask? Uh, I have a question okay, I think, mine, but I yeah. think we may have questions. Right. <clears throat> um, Russia was reckless um, in its um, attack on a Ukrainian nuclear plant. Um, and it scared a lot of uh, NATO you know, nations, obviously. Do you think that another attack or this like recklessness uh, were to happen again, it would warrant NATO's immediate intervention? You're going to have to repeat the question. Someone. I'm going to hand it over to Mike because I think this is a question that is in this area, and you can repeat it. So I'll repeat the question, but I will pass the football on to Arlington and to people who have actual diplomatic experience with the European Union, NATO, et cetera. And so the question is, if we see another 
negligent attack on another nuclear plant mm -hmm. akin to what we saw. And worse yet, my guess is if we saw something happen that literally led to the, the release of nuclear material, would that be sufficient grounds for intervention by NATO? Over to you, Arlington. I don't think so. I don't either. I, I don't think that would that would be enough. It would be a tragedy. Um, but uh, I, I'm not sure that that alone would trigger trigger a response. Uh, a last question or two. I think Kim wants to ask a question, and then one more. We've got two more questions on our end. Yeah, um, so Maria excellently noted uh, that it seems like our international institutions to some extent have sort of failed us in this situation, especially where you see you know, that the UN votes to, to condemn Russia for its actions and Russia has the power within this international institution to basically say like, well, no, you can't do that because I have a permanent seat on the Security Council. So I guess my my question is, does this event, uh, does anyone see this event potentially sparking sort of, um, not a renovation, but sort of a rethinking of how some of our international institutions are shaped or potentially putting a greater emphasis on international institutions other than the UN for being able to condemn and counter sort of these aggressions uh, that are occurring? It's a great question. I'm gonna just take the other, the second question as well. My question is about geopolitics and energy. Um, Professor Floyd, uh, uh, you mentioned that one of the countries to watch is Iran because of the high prices. What other countries do you think would make a deal with the European Union or with the US to lower um, the price of oil or gas? What other countries should we be watching? Well, I, I mean, on, on the, the short-term situation of, of meeting both gas and, and oil, uh, I think people are turning to the countries that make, make the most sense, the Gulf states. Um, well, Venezuela, I thought, might benefit Well, Venezuela too. is more of a U.S. Yeah. issue because, yeah. the, you know, the, kind, the quality of the oil that the Venezuelans produce is really only meant for mm -hmm. the U.S. refineries on the Gulf Coast. There are very few other countries that can take it. Um, but. Uh, you know, I think looking to the Gulf states would be the most. I don't. I don't see the states in Central Asia or the Caspian as having the capacity, even though there are pipelines to to Europe. Uh, the capacity just isn't isn't there. I think you know Europe's going to have to one build up their their reserves of gas. Uh, storage is down obviously after the winter, so the short term is going to be get gas wherever you can get it from, uh, and and fill it. Fill, fill up those reserves, but oil oil is a global problem, and we think we can fix our domestic situation, but it's still going to be gas price four to five dollars a gallon because the price is set in the, the world market, and so we can take care of ourselves, but it 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 it, it is a global problem, unlike the gas problem, which is more more Europe. Uh, I I think more Europe. Let me tackle uh, Kim's question about does this make the UN look bad and is the UN sort of not up to the task? And that's where we get to this theme of is this crisis um, taking us back to a new Cold War? Because during the Cold War, the UN Security Council was always blocked by either the US or the Soviet Union could veto a resolution on a war in another country. Um, and I think there's, and then there was this period in the 90s where we were working together and all those proxy war en ended and the Security Council performed its function as the original concept uh, indicated. Uh, I think there's a great fear now that, but the bifurcation in the Security Council might also include China. So you've got China and Russia giving emphasis to this, you know, sovereignty of the individual nation states versus the collective good of the international community. So we do and this is what my class talked about last night, you know, we um, we're back to this concept of was there ever really a liberal international order or was it always bounded by Western norms, Western values, and that a more confident China, maybe in cahoots with Russia, uh, could actually, you know, undermine or compromise the effectiveness of the UN. I would still argue, and I think what some people really do believe is that you got to a little bit take the power away from the Security Council and give it more to the General Assembly 
and that the capacity of the UN system on, on maybe on climate, but certainly on food insecurity, um, humanitarian crises, refugees, that there's part of the UN that's still pretty good at human security responses. They can do the, the human security stuff. They can't necessarily do the conflict prevention stuff. So whether the, the sort of interest of the middle powers shifts to the other part of the UN system, not the Security Council itself. Uh, but I do think you've had this validation of NATO and the European Union, as Des Dynan said. So there are some global, you know, regional slash global institutions that I think have been stimulated and revalidated by this crisis so far. Um, but your point is, is well taken that we do see that, but you know, let's, since 1945, did the UN, the UN is better as conflicts are ending, it doesn't necessarily perform all that well in the, in the prevention phase. So, um, Eric, I'm gonna turn it over to you to see if, unless you wanted to come in on that point, but I think we should probably wrap up. Uh, pe some people have to go to class. And um, any final thoughts from the Fairfax end? Yeah, so first I, I'd like to turn it over to uh, uh, Professor Steve Barnes. If you could just take a second to announce the event for tomorrow. There's another event on Ukraine and Professor Barnes is here. Could you give us a little information on that? Sure, great. Um, if everybody can hear me. So there's an event tomorrow. Uh, I'll pull the mask down for a second. Uh, there's an event tomorrow at 530, uh, which is gonna be held in hybrid form. The Actually the in-person were already full up. We have a smaller room here in Horizon. Um, It'll, it'll also be on Zoom. Um, if you go to russianstudies.gmu.edu, you can find information about it. It was also in the George today, um, where you can find out how to register and get a link for that. I would also point out that the Carter School for Peace and Com Conflict Resolution is doing an event on Thursday at 11 a.m. That's entirely on Zoom. Uh, that's also in the George today. You can find information about that. That's going to be entirely scholars from Ukraine speaking. Uh, moderated by uh, a, a scholar who is from Ukraine, but who is here at the Carter School. The event tomorrow will be faculty from the College of Humanities and Social Sciences. So we're getting lots of different voices uh, that are taking different approaches of how to think about that. So a lot of conversations going on this week. Excellent. And we do have one last question here. Uh, uh, Ellen, if we could have it. Abdullah, the, the last question is yours. Uh, so I had one question. We've been talking a lot about conventional approaches and that sort of pillar of ideals. But I want to take a look at like what we kind of missing. Uh, I had a conversation a couple of weeks ago, uh, or actually last week, as the conflict was starting, um, regarding rationality and irrationality and how that plays within theory and practice. And the two questions that the discussion kind of ended off on is, how do we deal with an actor that we may perceive as irrational? But then the flip side is, what are the benefits of pretending you're irrational so that you are perceived that way and then you have to kind of get the better hand that way? I think that's for an IR theory guy. <laughs> Like I think my, I do think that microphone is bugging Mike. Let me just talk loudly. I, so I would say this is a fascinating question, but it's actually one that nuclear strategists have been wrestling with almost since the dawn of the nuclear age. And, you know, Shelley writes quite extensively. And if you want more, you can take my intro to IR class with some people who are still <laughs> reeling in shock and awe from the midterm exam I gave them. But, right, so Shelley talks extensively about what we now euphemistically refer to as the Nixon madman theory. And yes, there can be huge advantages to feigning irrationality because so much of the game in the nuclear world is one of brinksmanship and not about how much pain you can deliver, but how much pain can you convince the other side you're willing to absorb and how close you're willing or able to come to that edge and maybe take the other side over. I think the challenge here with, with Putin and Professor Katz, I'm sure would echo this or say it better than I possibly could, is we really just fundamentally don't know. You know, people have been analyzing, he's looking very puffy and saying very strange things. And so I don't know if he really has gone off the deep end or if maybe he ate a lot of food and a lot of salt so that he could look like he's going off the deep end because he then realizes his threats would have to be taken that much more seriously. And I honestly don't know at the end of the day if we have a good answer for how you A, distinguish between the two not able to get into the mind, uh, but B, how you then engage in this very risky game of diplomatic signaling and coercion under these very intense circumstances. I do think... 
I believe, hope that we are going to learn a great deal from this because Xi Jinping in China hasn't come up a lot, but I will put in a couple of cents here. Uh, Xi Jinping, I think there's a very similar problem set. Xi and the PLA are definitely learning. I think they're pretty pissed at the Russians right now. I met with some, some Chinese scholars and I definitely get the sense that uh, they are recalculating and recalibrating. But I will also put out there as the roundabout way of getting back to Kim's excellent question. Uh, we got in our conversation last night, we were, we were lectured by our Chinese counterparts on the fact that, well, America, you're mad at us for 13 days in, not yet calling this an invasion. But you will recall when Japan invaded Manchuria, you waited about a decade to call this an invasion, and we haven't forgotten about this. So this thing, I think, has the potential not just to lead to a future Cold War. I think, as we euphemistically refer to it, we could be seeing the early stages of a return to multipolarity, and that could even be more complex than the bipolar world. We think we understood. Great. Eric, uh, thank you so much. Thanks to the uh, learning communities and all of you who participated. Great thanks to all of our speakers. Uh, Anton and Maria, we're really honored that you were here and sharing your uh, intense experiences with us. It really uh, added a huge, huge uh, important dimension to our discussion tonight. Um, and, you know, I don't think this crisis is going to end soon. So if there's an interest in reconvening at some point, we can certainly uh, figure out how to do that and we'll um, all things considered, I think the, the mics worked reasonably well, um, uh, so we, could, we know how to do this now. So um, over to you, but thank, thanks to everybody for coming, and um, uh, see you soon, I hope. Yes, thank you. Good to see you. All right, so we cancel right. tomorrow. Right. Awesome. <laughs> Have a good spring. Uh, yeah, no, I. The dust has had to settle for 13 days, in, but I, I worry a great deal about what this means for Taiwan. Less than the Russia does. It's like Taiwan has no choice but to really signal it's all in. And so if we think China and Russia, this is a genuine alignment that has the legs. Oh, well. <laughs> you took 133, right? You were in the first place. So you know, like, it seems like it's all under control, and all of a sudden everybody's out. Right now, it seems like it's under control. Um, but well, and that's what I'm saying. This is where, you know, it's a great question. Like, two weeks ago, I would have been like, you know, right now, risk were a stock head. Now I'm just going to get this inverted. I say my Abe is I'm out in public being like nukes and strategic clarity. That's what we need nukes. You need strategic clarity. And I do think that there is going to be a sense from our more 